In this video, we're going to be looking at topics 3D and 3E, which is metallic bonding and solid lattices. And this is part of the IAS chemistry course from Edexcel. So we're going to be looking at metallic bonding in terms of its structure as well as the actual bonding and electrostatic attractions. And we will then use this information to tell us about the properties of metals. We will then look at giant lattices, in particular metal lattices, ionic lattices and sp some specific covalent lattices, and then looking at the different structures that can be formed by carbon as well as iodine. So when we're looking at metals, metals have a regular arrangement of cations or positive ions surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons. So the outer electrons within a metal are very weakly held when they are um, in the atom. So they're not as attracted to the nucleus as the inner electrons. This allows them to become what we call delocalized, which in other words, free to move. And they can then move throughout the structure. And when these electrons become delocalized, they form these positive ions. So we have cations surrounded by the sea of delocalized electrons and we get our electrostatic attraction between the positive cations and the negative delocalized electrons. So remember for electrostatic attractions it is always an attraction between a positive and a negative and for metallic bonding that's the cations and the electrons and this is the definition of metallic bonding. What you need to be able to do is to draw a diagram like the one shown here where we have our metal cations and our delocalized electrons in the outer shells. Now metals typically have high melting points. One key exception is mercury because it's a liquid at room temperature and also gallium has quite a low melting point. It's not quite a liquid at room temperature but its boiling point is a sorry, its melting point is approximately 40 to 45 degrees. They also tend to be good electrical conductors and good thermal conductors, and they are malleable and ductile. And this means they can be shaped. So they can be, if they are malleable, they can be shaped into something else. And if they are ductile, we're specifically talking about drawing them out into wires. Now, in order to melt a metal, the forces of attraction between the delocalized electrons and the cations have to be overcome. This is the same as any other substance. We always have to overcome the forces of attraction. And this breaking of this attraction has to be done to such an extent that the cations become free to move and they are not then held in this lattice structure. Because they have this lattice structure, they are very strong and they are very tightly held. And this means that we require large amounts of energy in order to overcome the attractions. So they typically have very high melting points. As I said, there are a couple of exceptions to this, but you're not going to be asked to go into much detail about that. The number of delocalized electrons per cation will determine or will have a factor in the melting temperature of the metal. If you have a group one metal, it's going to have one delocalized electron per cation. So they have a lower melting point because you have less electrostatic attractions because there are less delocalized electrons. And you comparison to group two, group two have two delocalized electrons. So you're going to get more electrostatic attractions because you're having more positives and more negatives to have an attraction. D-block elements, or our transition metals, have even higher numbers of delocalized electrons, so they tend to have the highest melting points. So if you compare a group 1, group 2, and a transition metal, you will see an increase in their melting points. Again, some exceptions, but that's okay. Melting temperatures can also be affected by the charge to radius ratio of the cation. Um, so basically, the greater the charge to radius ratio, the stronger the attraction for the delocalized electrons. Now, what does this actually mean? Well, if we take lithium and sodium, 
both one positive cations, but different sizes, lithium being in period two, sodium being in period three, it means that the smaller cation, when we have the same charge, will have the higher melting temperature because it has it has a stronger attraction for the delocalized electrons. So lithium is the smaller of the two cations, meaning the delocalized electrons are going to be closer to its nucleus, causing those electrons to be held more tightly, therefore requiring more energy in order to be broken. So if you have the same charge, the smaller cation will have the higher melting temperature. Looking at conductivity, well, there are two different types. We can have electrical conductivity and thermal conductivity. So for electrical, when we see a voltage being applied to a metal, our delocalized electrons will then become attracted to the positive terminal of the cell and we start to get a flow of electric current. So we see the electricity flowing and we can measure it using a voltmeter or an ammeter. For thermal conductivity, again, it's the delocalized electrons that help us with this. The delocalized electrons can pass the energy through the metal um, in, in the form of kinetic energy and the heat can then travel through it. Um, and the cations are also very closely packed. So again, they can transfer energy in the form of kinetic energy in order to move from the one cation to another. So as the metal is heated, the cations and the delocalized electrons get more kinetic energy, bump into the other cations and electrons and pass the energy further along, allowing the, the heat to travel. When we're talking about malleability and ductility, as you said, this is all about making them into different shapes that's specific to malleability or drawing them into a wire for ductility. And the reason that we can do this is when we get a stress or a force being applied, the cations exist in layers and these layers can start to slide. As the layers start to slide, you can see that we then get the delocalized electrons moving with the, the layers and we start to see some repulsion. So instead of there being delocalized electrons acting as a buffer between the cations here, what happens is the cations come close together. There are no delocalized electrons in this area and therefore we get a repulsion between the cations and that allows the cations to move further apart. So then moving the metal into a different shape. So it's all to do with the layers sliding over one another and then increasing the repulsion between our cations. Now when we're talking about the structure of a metal, we are looking at it as a lattice structure. Now we've looked at lattice structures before when we discussed ionic and potentially some covalent when we did GCSE. Um, we're going to bring metallic into this now. So we have this regular arrangement of cations surrounded by delocalized electrons. And we've seen this example um, diagram and we've talked about the different properties. So what's important is that we have this regular arrangement. When we compare this to ionic lattices, they have a regular arrangement again of cations, but this time it is of anions. And when we think about the properties, similar to metals, they also have fairly high melting temperatures. They have poor electrical conductivity when they're solid, but good when they are molten. And we talked about that back in topic 3A, because the ions are free to move. They are brittle, because again, they form these layers that can repel each other. And they can be soluble in water. And we'll discuss that further in topic 7B when we're looking at intermolecular forces. We can also get some covalent lattices and you met some of these last year where we call them a giant covalent or a network covalent lattice and these consist of this giant network of atoms all linked by covalent bonds and there are four that are very common. We have diamond, graphite, graphene and silicon four oxide. So diamond, graphite and graphene are all different types of carbon, whereas silicon oxide is, of course, a silicon base, but it is in the same group. And silicon oxide, actually, we can see is sand. 
So if we look at diamond first of all, in diamond each carbon has four sigma bonds to four other carbon atoms. So remember sigma bonds is when we get this end to end overlap of the P or the S orbitals. So just a reminder from covalent that's our sigma bond where we get this area of overlap. So each carbon atom has four sigma bonds to four other carbon atoms. Because then that gives us four bonding pairs, we make a tetrahedral shape. And we know that tetrahedral shapes have a bond angle of 109.5. Now because they have four sigma bonds, no delocalized electrons, all covalent bonds in this giant lattice, diamond has an extremely high melting point. Because in order to melt it, you have to overcome these strong covalent bonds. So we have to break the actual covalent bonds themselves in order to, to melt diamond. Um, and this requires a huge amount of energy to the point where it needs to be done like on an industrial level, we're talking high thousands of um, degrees. When we compare this to graphite, graphite has the carbon atoms with three sigma bonds to three different carbon atoms, and they form these hexagonal rings. We can see that in the structure here. So this carbon in the center is bonded to carbon one, two, and three and each of those are then bonded to three others. That leaves us with one electron in a p orbital that is not involved in the bonding. And what happens is these become delocalized. So we have our p orbitals and each of these carbons like this in the diagram and each of those p orbitals has one electron. And the one electron becomes delocalized and they can move within the layers of the, the graphite. So we have these layers of interlocking hexagonal rings on top of one another with delocalized electrons in the center. These delocalized electrons then allow graphite to become a very good conductor of electricity. So whenever you did electrolysis, if you were a triple student back in GCSE, you would have used carbon electrodes these are made of graphite because it is a very good conductor of electricity but doesn't react with a lot of things. It can only conduct electricity parallel to its layers because the delocalized electrons can only stay within their individual layers. So if you have electrons between layer one and two, they stay between layer one and two. They can't move down to layer three and four and so on and so on. Now, graphene is, in terms of bonding, exactly the same as graphite. The only difference is that graphene is a very thin sheet of carbons where it's actually only one atom thick. So graphite has lots and lots of layers. Graphene is just one of these layers. It is very, very thin, as we said. However, it is very, very strong. It is actually 200 times stronger than steel. And in the textbook, it goes into a bit more detail about the uses of graphite and in terms of the strength. You don't need to know this for the exam, but it is interesting to read and to find out a bit more information. Graphene is also a very good thermal conductor because it is just that one thin layer of the carbon so the heat can easily pass through it and it can also self-repair any damage that it gets. And again, you don't need to know how it does this, just that it does. The main question that you could get for um, a past paper would be what's the difference between graphite and graphene? And you just have to explain that graphite is lots of layers of these interlocking hexagonal rings of carbon, whereas graphene is just one layer. Now, there are lots of different types of bonding and structure that you have to be able to identify um, in terms of the examples. So you can be very commonly be given different examples of compounds and asked to explain the differences in their structure and bonding or explain the differences in properties due to the structure and bonding. So you have to know the bonding in terms of the electrostatic attractions. 
the structure is looking at is it a lattice or is it a discrete molecule like in covalent structures and then looking at the properties so we have metallic ionic and covalent and then covalent, of course, can be broken down into polar covalent and non-polar covalent. And it can also be broken down to giant lattice or discrete molecular. So you could use something like this, like a tree, in order to tell you some information about the properties to figure out what type of bonding it is. So if the substance conducts electricity when solid, it's either yes or no. If it's yes, that can only be metallic, and metallic bondings have giant lattices. If it's a no, that could be ionic or covalent. You then move to, well, does it conduct when it is molten? If it's yes, then it's ionic bonding, and of course that can only be giant lattice. And if it's no, then we're left with covalent bonding. But we have to distinguish between the two, and if it has a high melting temperature, then yes, it's a lattice because we have to break all of these covalent bonds. Or if it's no, then it's molecular because we have to only break the weak intermolecular bonds. So I can go through a series of different steps to identify the different types of bonding. And this table here explains all of the physical properties that we're looking at for metallic, ionic, covalent and covalent molecular. So you have to know the particles present, the type of bonding, the intermolecular forces of attraction, are they there or not? You don't need to know what they are at the moment. You will learn that in topic seven. You also need to know roughly about the boiling temperatures and the melting temperatures, conductivity and the solubility. You did learn some of this at IGCSE. Just at A level, you need to just go into a little bit more detail and talk in particular looking at the metallic and also looking at the difference between the giant covalent and the molecular. So let's finish off by looking at some past paper questions. We're going to look at the January 2019 paper first, and that is diamond, graphite and other carbon structures. So in diamond, the carbon atom is covalently bonded to four others in a three-dimensional structure. Draw a diagram showing this arrangement. Now we're only looking for one carbon bonded to the other four. So we're not looking at a huge diff, um, structure for diamond. We're only looking at one small section. And what they're really looking for here is that you show roughly the bond angles and you show roughly the shapes. So because it is diamond, it is going to have a tetrahedral shape and of course they are all sigma bonds. So we have the carbon bonded to another carbon bonded to the second with the tetrahedral shapes. Oh, sorry, not a CL. So we've got the wedge bond and the hash bond giving us our shape here. Then we want to explain the shape and the bond angle of the arrangement of carbon atoms in these. Well, we've already said that the shape is tetrahedral. The bond angle in a tetrahedral is 109.5. That's from topic 3C. And the reason for this is where we have four bonding pairs of electrons and they, we want to see the minimum repulsion between the pairs. So they sit at the bond angle of 109.5 because we want to get the minimum repulsion between the four bonding pairs. That's your three marks. And there's your mark scheme. So showing our four sigma bonds and the tetrahedral shape. You can either show the wedge and the hash bond or you can just have the straight single bonds. That's absolutely fine. Notice that we will not accept the bonds at right angles. So when you used to draw out bonds like that for carbon, no longer do we want to see that when we're looking at a bonding and structure question. When it's organic, then that's different and we will talk about that when we get to organic. But here we are looking for it to be a tetrahedral shape. And lastly, from the June 2017 paper, the element sodium and the compound sodium bromide are both solid at room temperature. 
Name the type of bonding in sodium and explain how this bonding holds the structure together. Well, sodium is a metal, so we have metallic bonding. That's the first mark. And how it holds the structure together, we have sodium has delocalized electrons, which have an electrostatic attraction. to the positive cations in the lattice. So we get this electrostatic attraction between the positive cations and the delocalized electrons. And there's two marks. Now I've not went into too many examples here about the properties. Um, what you may find is lots of questions about comparing and contrasting the properties and it's not necessarily always about explaining them it can sometimes be what is the difference but if you were looking for the difference between for example the the conductivity of an ionic and a metallic then you would go into the fact that metallic has delocalized electrons ionic does not um and so on and you would explain and go into detail so you would use the table that we previously saw um, to explain your answers and you'll find lots of practice questions on those in past papers as well as in the textbook of course if you have any questions on topic 3d or topic 3e feel free to leave a comment below and we hope to see you back soon